Welcome, everybody. Greetings from San Antonio. Hope everything is well where you are. We're uh, getting into that time of year where the uh, temperature is every day now in the mid to high 90s. In another few weeks, it'll click over to the hundreds. But at any rate, last couple of weeks, uh, I didn't mean to do this. It just kind of happened, uh, you know, looking back on it. But I seem to be in the middle of uh, somewhat of a little mini series here. Uh, the first uh, first week on that thing was talking about your perception of God. Then the next week, next week after that, we talked about the concept of what happens to you, or what do you do, or what's your reaction when the bottom falls out, of which it inevitably does from time to time. Today, I want to talk on the subject of how do you recognize the hand of God in your life? Because we've got some major, major problems when it comes to that area, recognizing God. This is all over the Bible, this concept that we mistake things that we attribute to God that might not be attributable to God. Other things God does for us or to us, and, and we don't make that connection. So the main problem is that we are in a physical world, and God is his spirit. And so we're, we're constantly doing this. We're, we're just talking past each other most of the time. I'm reminded of when the crucifixion of Jesus, he, he got resurrected, you know, after three days. And Mary Magdalene, one of his, I'll call her a disciple. She wasn't an apostle or anything, but she was a disciple. She followed him. She ministered to him. She took care of him and so forth. And she comes to the tomb early that Sunday morning. She's going to formally start to, to dress the body. What I mean by dress the body is the, the ointments and the spices and so forth that they use um, for the burial uh, part. Because they had just done a you know, slap dab uh, job the night before because the, the timing uh, was off and they had to get him into the ground you know, before the Sabbath started and so forth. So th there was a lot of uh, confusion and uncertainty and everything else going on that night. So she is going to come the next morning and formally go ahead and take care of the body and get it set for the uh, entombment. And she gets there, of course, and the body is not there. The body's gone. There's a couple of angels there, and they explain to her, you know, what's going on, that he's not here, he's risen, and so forth. And she's, she's still confused. I mean, these guys knew about the resurrection. Jesus had not warned them, but he informed them about the resurrection. But there's such a disconnect in their minds and in reality that it was hard for them to really emotionally and mentally grasp what that actually meant. And so the angels are trying to explain it to her. And she goes outside, you know, she leaves the tomb area. And she's basically, she's looking for the body. And she sees a guy standing there. And she comes up to him and approaches him and says, Sir, what have you done with the body of my Lord? And he just looks at her. He says, Mary, don't you know me? For some reason, he had either changed his appearance. Now, remember, he's in a resurrected body now. So what that physical manifestation was, can he change his appearance at will? Duh. Well, of course, he could if he wanted to. 
uh, was she still just in such an emotional fog that she just didn't get it and connect the dots that that was her Lord, that was Jesus himself who was talking to her because she thought he was the gardener. She assumed he was the gardener and she's having this conversation with him until he says, Mary, don't you know? And then boom, she got it. How much of our lives are spent like that? We come to God in prayer. We have problems. We have indecision. We have things that happen to us. And, and we don't know what to do. We don't know where it's coming from half the time. We don't get it. And so we go to God in prayer. And sometimes we're exasperated. Sometimes we're frustrated. Sometimes we're angry. Sometimes we're just stupid. And, and we don't really get it. And so God responds to us. But how much of that time, how much of that interplay between God responding to us and us asking, do we just not get it? We miss all the signs. Because maybe we're looking for a different sign. We're looking for what we come with our own agenda. We have what we want. And we project everything into what we want. And so when God comes with a, resp a response or a reply, half the time we don't even recognize it because it's not what we're looking for. And so the disconnect just keeps on going. So back to the meaning of circumstances in our lives. How do you approach that? I mean, the things happen to us every day. Some things are planned. I mean, you know that maybe, you know, you have to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning. Well, that's a given. You don't have to ask God, oh God, what do I do today? Uh, and make a big prayer thing about, do I go to work today and show up at eight o'clock in the morning? No, there's just certain things. If you have to go to the restroom, I, I, I don't mean to be crass and, and stuff, but sometimes we get so stupid about this stuff. If you have to go to the restroom, that's not generally a matter of prayer. Unless you're stuck someplace where you can't get to a bathroom, then you might uh, throw a prayer up and ask God to help you out. But there's certain things in lives that are just, they take care of themselves. And we don't have to make a big deal about it. But there's other things in life. Okay, you're supposed to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning. You get there, you show up, you're ready to go. And then the first phone call you have, boom, it throws your whole day off. Things that you didn't anticipate, things that you didn't foresee, things that you didn't see coming. And now you have to adapt, you have to shuck and jive, you have to, you know, rope a dope type thing. You have to adapt to whatever comes upon you. And that is the essence of life. You're driving down the road, boom, you get a flat tire. Now your whole day's changed. Or you're driving down the road and you see the red and blue lights behind you. And you're getting a ticket now. Your whole day has changed. So our lives are completely, no, not completely, but for the most part, they are based on indecisions things, circumstances, events that we don't see coming. Some of us are very, very good at navigating through that minefield. Others of us are not. When we get out of our comfort zone, we don't respond the way that you know we, we think we might. And that's where the problem really, really starts to get interesting. So for the most part, we don't recognize that we have a problem sometimes. And not recognizing the source of the problem or the nature of the problem, we definitely don't have a solution for that problem. We're just walking around in a fog here. 
half the time. So how do you recognize the hand of God in your life? Is your life basically structured in such a way that everything and anything that happens to you, you ascribe it to fate, inevitability, uh, natural consequences of my, you know, my action here is going to precipitate a reaction down the road here. We kind of get that. Do you look at life as just nothing but a set of karma? You know, I did something here. Well, I'm going to get paid back over here. Or I'm going to get a reward over here. It kind of makes a big deal as to how you approach that aspect of life, how you view the circumstances, how you recognize where the problem is coming from, how you recognize who is in the mix to help you. Because if you believe that everything is just karma, if you believe that everything is just a natural result of con uh, you know, the consequences of my actions and so forth, God doesn't have a very, very big part in that, in your life. But if you as a Christian, if you live your life in such a way that you are looking to please him, that you are looking to follow him, that you are looking for his guidance, his approval, his blessing, then it takes on a whole different meaning. Now, if something happens to you, now you have a whole different set of questions. Is this God doing this to me because I screwed up? Is this God doing something like this because he wants to teach me something? Does he want to guide me away from this thing here and kind of push me over to the side over there so that maybe I, I need a time of refreshing? Maybe I need a time to slow down. Maybe I need to just contemplate and think about things. And so he takes me out of this rat race and puts me on my back over here. Your perception of God dictates all your responses to everything around you. If you don't believe in God, God's not a factor in your life. That's simple. If you do believe in God, if you do trust him, if you do follow him, then everything that happens to you, now you've got to ask, like I said a second ago, a whole different set of questions. Some reasons for our, our disconnect with God. There's a few of them. Uh, could be pride. No, I can handle this. You know, I, I'm a full grown man. You know, I, I can do this. I don't need any help from anybody. No, I can figure it out. I don't need any blasted instructions. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Pride is a big that keeps us you know, from that relationship. Uh, apathy. Uh, whatever happens to me, happens to me. I have no control over it. I'm not going to sweat it. I'm not going to worry about it. I don't care. Whatever happens, happens. There's that aspect of it. And then, of course, we have our own agenda. You know, we have certain goals in life, maybe. We have certain points or stations in life of which we want to be or have attained or got at certain points in our lives. And so our whole life, since some people are so structured like that, they're very successful. They're very single-minded. They are goal getters. They are, you know, goal setters. And I, I kind of admire those people because I tend to be kind of the opposite in that sense. But there are some people that their lives are so structured. They are so consumed. They are so consumed with a goal that everything is laid out for them. And so they don't really question is God involved in any of this or not? So, look at the reality of life. You're minding your own business one day and you're walking through a campus. There's a job fair going on. And at the end of the day, you have had two really successful, productive interviews for a potential job. 
career. Which one do you take? Do you involve God in the decision making? If you're so purpose driven minded as such, uh, God might not factor into this. There, there's a whole lot of other things that are going to take place first. Uh, are you karma type guy? That uh, whatever will be, will be, and you just kind of flip a coin? Or do you go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I've got two options here. I don't know which one. Is. I can't see five years down the road, 10 years down the road, a lifetime down the road. I have no idea. But you can. You do. What would you have me to do, Lord? And so you make a decision. I'm not guaranteed. Nine times out of ten, that decision, that day, uh, which one you're going to take, that's going to affect the rest of your life. What about a marriage thing? Good grief, you talk about a life-changing thing. That decision of who you're going to walk down that aisle with. What school you go to? What, what, what do you major in? There, there are certain, and there's not really that many. We, we've got job, we've got uh, education, we've got marriage, uh, we've got place of residency. And I know all these are kind of intertwined. Uh, generally, your job is going to dictate where you're going to live and such. Uh, who you marry is going to dictate a whole bunch of things. Your level of education, uh, your ability to make money, all these things are interchangeable, but all of them come down to a decision. And how much of your life, is my question today, is your decision based on what God wants you to do? How do you recognize when God is opening one door and closing another door? The fact that you can apply for this job, but you can't apply for that job, how is that going to affect you 15 years down the line? You're at work one day and you walk by the, the bulletin board or you're online or something and a, a job thing pops up. And boy, I really want to do that. Yeah, 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 I can do that. I've got experience and, and I've worked 10 years doing this thing. I could do that. And you get down to the end of the blurb there and it says, uh, a master's degree required or a bachelor's degree required. Well, all you've got is the AA from the community college, let's say. You got tons of experience, but you don't have a degree in it. Now, what do you do? So, you got the financial aspect, you got the, the job thing, you got the academic thing, you got the marriage thing, you got all these decision making things that are literally life changing do you see god in any of these in your life so how do you recognize the hand of god in your life when that door shuts, do you see God shutting the door? Or do you see your stupidity shutting the door? Your pride shutting the door? Your ignorance shutting the door? Your agenda shutting the door? Sometimes it gets really, really hard to distinguish the two. So where does God meet you? Do you have a time of which you meet with God? Do you meet with God? Do you only pull that plug when the, the bottom has fallen out and you don't know where to go? Where do you meet God and how do you recognize the consequences. Well, we can't go to him in that sense, you know, in a physical sense. I can't 
pop up to heaven and have a, a conversation with him, explain my troubles, explain my dilemma, uh, tell him what my options are, which one should I pick, and so forth. I can't go there to heaven in that sense. But he can come to me. He can come to me. He has a track record of meeting us where we are. Ever since the Garden of Eden, he always meets us where we are. All he wants is for us to acknowledge him. That's it. He, he's not asking for us to prove ourselves worthy. I mean, that's, that ship has sailed. Forget that. He's not waiting for us to have a certain period of time of which we haven't blown it. You know, whether it be an hour, a month, a day, we, you know, what? No, he's, he's not waiting for that. Because that, that's not going to happen. He meets us where we are. In our circumstances, in the everyday, mundane, repetitive parts of our lives sometimes, that's where he meets us. Our biggest problem is recognizing that. And before that, our really biggest problem is acknowledging it. To let him know that we understand that at this point in our lives, for this decision, or my reaction to this problem, or what do I do now? I need more information. It's way above my pay grade. I need somebody who has my back, somebody who loves me, somebody who knows what they're doing, who can see the future, who can see the ramifications of each and every decision I make and follow it through to the bitter end and come to me and say, this is what you need to do. And gee whiz, wouldn't you know, I just happen to have somebody like that in my corner. I will never leave you nor forsake you to say He wants us to include him in our decision making. You know, Paul, you remember his conversion? Remember what he was doing <laughs> the moment that he got saved? He was on his way with letters of authority. Warrants, if you please, subpoenas, whatever, you know, legal thing you want. He had the authority to go from Jerusalem to Damascus for one reason and one reason only. To catch Christians, to imprison them, and if need be, to have them killed. That's the Apostle Paul, folks. And he had done it before. He literally not only just assented unto the killing, let's say, of Stephen, the preacher there in Acts chapter 7 and 8, not just acceding to that and agreeing to it. No, no, no. Paul was re physically, directly responsible himself for the killing of Christians. He gave the authority. He said, kill them. He was hardcore. It didn't, it didn't get any more hardcore than that. He's on his way. He's not looking for Jesus. He's not looking to, to switch sides. He's not looking to turn his life around. He's not burdened by guilt. He's not burdened by sin. He's not burdened by the repercussions of the decisions of his life. He's a happy guy. He's a successful guy. 
He is an influential guy. He is at the top of his game. He's not looking to repent. He's not looking to, you know, wah, wah, wah. What am I doing here? You know, killing Christians and persecuting the church and so forth. No. It hadn't even entered, entered his head yet. He's still 100% on the other side. And he's on his way to Damascus. Jesus meets him on the road. Ah, he's not going to find Jesus. Jesus meets him where he lives. And at the end of that little discussion, was born the greatest Christian that ever lived outside Jesus Christ himself. You've heard of Jonah? Jonah and the whale. We all know that story. You realize that when God came to Jonah, he was a prophet, and God gave him an assignment. The assignment was, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh would be, you know, the equivalent to be like New York City, let's say, or London or Tokyo or something. It was a biggie. Not just, you know, size-wise, but influence, riches, influence, the whole bit. Nineveh was a monster, monster biggie. God goes to know Jonah. He says, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them. There's no big discussion with Jonah. I mean, he is a prophet. He's got one job in life, and that's to do what God tells him to do. Jonah hears that assignment from God. He doesn't sit down and discuss it with God. He doesn't give the pros and cons. He doesn't say, well, you know, Lord, I'm kind of busy this week. Uh, maybe next week I can find him a little bit. No, no, no. Jonah just gets in God's face immediately. Imagine this. He gets in God's face. And he says, fooey on you. I'm not going. Because Nineveh, of course, was the biggest oppressor, the, the biggest threat, the biggest fear that Israel had, you know, at that time. And there was no way he was going to go to the enemy's stronghold, their capital city, and try to get these guys converted so that God will love them. And uh, who knows what they're going to do to Israel at that point. So he had in his mind a very, very good reason. He did not want to see these guys saved. He did not want to see these guys in a good relationship with God. He did not want to see anything good happen to these evil people because they were out to kill all Israelites. So he just gets in God's face. He says, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to go. And so he runs down to the seaside, gets on a ship, and he's on his way to Spain. The complete 180 degree opposite of where Nineveh is. Well, God doesn't freak out. God doesn't sit there and wah, wah, wah. Gee whiz. What happened here? You know, wow, he grew a pair all of a sudden, didn't he? Whoa, what do I do now? <laughs> no, God just lets him go. He gets on the ship. They get out there in the middle of the Mediterranean to see, you know, turns to a you know storm and so forth the, the boat's ready to get swamped and you know the story how they ended up they, they figured out Jonah was the culprit here God was uh, mad at somebody they drew straws and so forth they came to this Jonah yeah he fessed up yeah God's mad at me because I rejected you know his assignment and so forth and it just took boom, threw him overboard wow what a set of circumstances to get yourself out of what do you do now you're going down for the third time. You're gurgling. You're spitting. You're coughing. You're choking. You go under the water, and that's it. Now you're just floating and wafting down. God has this whale that he created expressly for this purpose. That whale comes and swallows Jonah. Jonah sits there in that belly of the whale underneath that water for three days and three nights. Hmm. Where have I heard that analogy before? 
three days and three nights. Huh, okay. He's dead as a doornail, folks. The symbolism is just rampant here of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. After three days, God tells that whale, swim up to the land, spit them out. Jonah gets spit out on the beach there. Tightens his belt and so forth. And he marches straight over to Nineveh. Walks into the city, preaches, and wouldn't you know it, his worst nightmare just came true. The city got saved. The entire city, from the king on down to the lowest servant, got saved. Do you think Jonah would be happy? He's still ticked off. He's still mad at God. Because God saved the whole entire city. God met Jonah where he was. Drowning in the midst of an ocean. Now, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think your circumstances have been or are or even will be that dire. But it makes no difference. God will meet you where you are. He'll meet you where you are. There's one verse in Proverbs that always comes to mind. You know, I asked the question a minute ago and said, you know, how, how do we know? It was God, you know, opening doors, closing doors, opportunities, setbacks, restrictions, uh, bounty, you know, blessing, promotion, so forth. How do we know if it's God? I mean, Job had a hard time figuring it out. His three buddies, you know, they, they never did figure it out. So it is, a, it is a tough thing. It's not that easy. The Proverbs tells us, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. That's all he's asking for. Acknowledge him. He's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for goodness. He's not looking for accomplishment. He's not looking for anything. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You know, Daniel. God met him where he was, and where he find himself one day. You got it. Lion's den. I've never been in a lion's den. You know, I've had a lot of stuff happen to me in life. A lot of bad things happen to me in life, but nothing that extreme. Doesn't matter in God's book where you are, what the circumstances are. Good grief! I mean, He can He can solve anything. He'll meet you where you are. He meets a lion, Daniel, in a lion's den. Jacob, the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. Character-wise, he was a lousy guy. He really was. Until God started to put him through the meat grinder. And then slowly over a 20-year period, he kind of shaped up pretty good. But in God's world, he had one more hurdle to pass. And so the night before he was to meet his brother Esau, whom he had ticked off and robbed and, you know, stole from and so forth. And Esau was, you know, out to kill him and so forth. 20 years have gone by. They haven't seen each other. Both of them have succeeded in their own right. And now the meeting is going to come between them. And Jacob doesn't know how this is going to go. Is Esau still wanting to kill me? Because I stole the birthright? Has he mellowed out? Has success kind of, you know, changed him a little bit? He didn't know. 
And so the night before the meeting, God met him where he was. In panic, in fear, in trepidation, in the uncertainty of what was going to come. And God in the form of the angel of the Lord. He appeared to Jacob as a man. And they began to fight and to wrestle. And that wrestling match went on all night until the break of day. And the angel of the Lord looks at him and says, you passed. You didn't beat me, but you hung in there. You showed that the last 20 years of your life, you have improved. You have acknowledged me. And as a reminder of this night, I'm going to give you a little parting present. And the angel of the Lord touched his hip. Just a little finger touched. And Jacob was crippled for the rest of his life. Lived another 40, 50, 60 years or so. Successful beyond his imagination or his dreams. But every day of his life, he was constantly reminded of the fact that I met God face to face and I held on. I trusted him. I didn't let go. And for him to remind me every day because of this limp, because of this pain, because of this uncertainty, because of this just crippleness, I'll never forget it. I'll never doubt him again. Zacchaeus, little kind of insignificant guy in the New Testament, Jesus time, but he's a little short run of a guy, little tiny guy. And Jesus is going to come to his town one day. You know, the big old hubbub and everybody, you know, the buzz going around. Oh, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And he shows up. But the crowds are so thick and the throng is so pressed around Jesus, Zacchaeus can't get can't get a sight of him. He, he would, just wants to be able to say, I saw him. I saw Jesus with my own eyes. And in his world at that time, at that moment, that's the only thing that he wanted out of life. But he couldn't get to Jesus. But he saw which way the crowd was going. He saw, you know, he could look down the road and he, he could see what's going on. And he knew Jesus was going to pass by a certain thing. So, aha, he said, boom. He runs down a few blocks or so, and he climbs up a sycamore tree. And he's sitting there in the branches. Now he's got, he's got elevation now. He can see everything around him. So when Jesus, in the middle of this big throng and this big crowd, comes along, he gets to see Jesus with his own eyes. He doesn't have to hop up or look for a stool or have somebody put him on their shoulder, any of this stuff. No, he can now see Jesus, and he's a happy guy. Jesus gets up to the tree, and he stops. Whoa, it's even better. Now I get to see him longer and so forth. And then it gets even better. Jesus looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus. He calls him by name. He says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to have supper at your house tonight. This whole world changed at that moment. He couldn't get to Jesus. But Jesus came to him. And that event where he felt so maybe ashamed because of his height, maybe, his inability, that he wasn't able to see Jesus the way he wanted to. Jesus comes to him and turns his whole life around. Zacchaeus, come on in. I'm going to eat at your place tonight. The woman at the well, John chapter 4. We all know that story. She comes to the well at noon. 
And, and I've mentioned this before, maybe, maybe for God, I don't know. Paying attention. But she's there at noon for a reason. She can't go early in the morning or in the late afternoon when all the other girls went. She's ostracized. She's a bad girl. Everybody knows it. She's got a reputation. She's been shacking up with six, seven guys. The guys she's shacked up with now that they're not married or anything. Everybody knows her. Everybody knows her reputation. So none of the other women want anything to do with her. So for her, the only time that she can go and get water as such, not getting booted out or getting yelled at or getting ostracized or something, is at noon, in the heat of the day, all by herself. One day she gets there. And who's there waiting for her? Sitting on a well. None other than Jesus himself. She probably had no idea that, you know, she would ever have a meeting with Jesus, let alone a conversation. But in her shame, Maybe in her defiance, she goes at noon and Jesus meets her exactly where she is. In her place of isolation, in her place of shame, in her place of being ostracized and cut off from the group, Jesus meets her exactly where she is. David, oh, what a life I, I, I could spend the next day talking about the life of David and his relationship with God. But I think he summed it up in just one little verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. David couldn't always go to God, but God always came to David. <coughs> I'll leave you with two verses. One from the Apostle Paul. From that dialogue that he had with Jesus on that road to Damascus. One line stands out. Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, what will you have me to do? If you can make that part of your Christian life. I'll guarantee everything will be different. I'm not saying it's going to be improved necessarily. Maybe God, who knows what God has for you. I'm not saying it's going to be all happiness and roses and sweetness and light, unicorns and rainbows and so forth. But if you make that verse a part of your walk with him, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now I'll guarantee this last verse. We already said it. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lay not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Heavenly Father, it is so hard for us in this life with our agenda, our pride, our ignorance, and everything that goes into the mix of what we are. It is so hard for us to just let loose and trust you. We got the ignorance thing factor, we, we got the pride factor, we got our agenda factor, we, we got all the 
these things, messing up the waters. God give us grace to get rid of the junk, to get rid of the, the chaff, and just keep the grain, to focus on the one entity, the one person, the one God that not only wants to and can bless us and lead us and guide us. Lord, if I've learned anything at all, you want to do this for us more than we even want to do it for ourselves. God, help us to get over that hump, whatever it may be, that we can live our lives from the standpoint Lord, what would I have me to do? And trust in the Lord with all that I have. Father, bless us in Jesus' name.